Well, friends, it's it's wonderful to be with you. It's wonderful to be sitting at this beautiful piano and to offer a homily from here. And it's a privilege to be playing with the maestro Sam Pang on viola and Natalie Tweed, a pro jazz drummer who's a part-time student here at Regent College. So it's a delight. And it's great to do this just after Resurrection Sunday. So here we go. The title, what I'd like to talk about, is Improvising Church. Scripture is the source of harmony, rhythm, and soul. Improvising Church, Scripture as a source of harmony, rhythm, and soul. And in a nutshell, what I want to offer is that, well, the remarkable context we're in is that it's in my lifetime and in many of your lifetimes that in the West, at any rate, Culture has shifted from being largely societies that are Christian societies, certainly in the 70s when I was born that was the case, to being largely post-Christian. In the cities where I've lived, Sydney and Vancouver, that shift has taken place in my lifetime. Remarkable. Uh, it, it's a kind of 1600, first time in 1600 years kind of shift, which means, I believe, that we need to, with the Bible in our hands, discern around church what are the things that we do and what are the things that we are that are more culturally determined and what is scripture the biblical story inviting us into in other words how do we play our part faithfully in the biblical story at this time in history and the history of our neighborhoods how can we play our part faithfully in the biblical story improvising church Scripture as a source of harmony, rhythm, and soul. That's what I want to talk about. And I'd like to talk, offer jazz as a metaphor for improvising church and explore that. Is that okay? Because the remarkable thing is that both jazz music and also Christianity are deeply rooted in a tradition. Jazz music uh, is deeply rooted in the jazz tradition. I know most people think, a lot of people think, that jazz musicians just sit at their instrument and plonk their fingers down any old tower, and that's jazz. But actually, <laughs> jazz is rooted deeply in a tradition. And jazz musicians, like Natalie Tweed and myself, have spent literally thousands of hours learning to tap the rhythms and hum the melodies and getting the tradition in our bones. And then each time we come to play jazz together, we play fresh improvisations on the jazz tradition. And in a similar way, the church is deeply rooted in a tradition, the biblical tradition. And we're here at Regent College together to immerse in the biblical tradition. And I want to suggest, on the basis of the creativity of the biblical authors themselves, that we need to immerse in that biblical tradition and then improvise fresh melodies on that tradition. I want to suggest actually that we need to almost like a riff on the biblical tradition in our particular neighborhoods. In jazz music, a riff is like a, a riff is like a little motif, a blues or a jazz motif. So here might be a riff. That's a riff, right, Natalie? And so you could, you know, in jazz music, you could riff on a chord progression using that motif. So that would be riffing, you know, and of course I've never played that before and we'll never play it again. But, you know, you're riffing on a chord progression, you know. That's the way jazz works, but it's rooted deeply in the tradition. And I think that as churches, we need to riff on the biblical tradition in our particular neighborhoods. So there's predictability and there's improvisation when it comes to church, I think. The improvisation, I think, our impetus for the improvisation is the creativity of the biblical authors themselves. 
Just think of some of the key motifs that make up Christian theology and biblical theology. Think, for example, of the motif of a covenant. That's an extraordinary motif. The covenant in the ancient Near East was, it was a contract, if you like, an ancient contract in the context of international relations. I'm just trying to illustrate here the creativity of the biblical authors. A covenant it didn't start out in the Bible. It started out as an ancient, a tool, an instrument of international relations. And so the great kings of, say, the Neo-Assyrian, Neo-Babylonian empires, they would subordinate or conquer or threaten much weaker kings. And they would bind them with a covenant or a treaty. And these treaties were militarized. They were barbaric. They were an instrument of propaganda on pain of utter destruction and the torture and the death of the king and their families. A covenant was a militarized imperial instrument. And these biblical scribes, by the inspiration of the Spirit, took up that motif, that barbaric motif of a covenant, and used it as a way of revealing the grace of God. A covenant of grace. They as much as said, our God is a God who covenants with us and who gives the land instead of taking it. The generosity of God, the divine supply, they revealed something about God through this terrifying motif of a covenant. What imagination, you know? What imagination? What improvisation? What creativity? Most bravery is that, you know? And you could say the same about so many motives in the New Testament. My mind goes, for example, to the peace of Christ. You know, in our churches, many of our churches, we pass the peace of Christ every Sunday. And yet the peace of Christ, of course, was a beautiful appropriation of that imperial propaganda motif of the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, which again was a very militarized, really barbaric uh, metaphor. But the Christians said the peace of Christ and turned that metaphor on its head to, to, to symbolize something beautiful about what Christ was inviting us into in terms of human relations. The creativity of the biblical authors, I think, not only uh, allows us to improvise church, but insists that we need to be creative in our particular neighborhoods with the Bible in our hands, especially at this post-Christendom term. Of course, there's going to be a whole lot of continuity as well, just as there is in jazz. There's always a tradition. There is always scripture that's at the center. And it's all about Jesus. And of course, we can draw on, on ancient and historical liturgies, for example, in the Anglican or Catholic or Orthodox tradition. And that is good and, and true and beautiful and very, very important. But nonetheless, even within these historical liturgical traditions, there, we're not... Uh, we're not removed from the responsibility of improvising on the biblical story in our particular context. Improvising on the biblical story, fresh improvisations that make sense on the context in which God has placed us. Well, let me unpack that piece by piece with Natalie and Sam. First of all, we improvise, we immerse in the tradition. We immer whether that tradition is a biblical story or as jazz musicians, we immerse in the tradition. So what we do as jazz musicians, we learn from the masters. So as a jazz pianist, when I'm listening to jazz, if there's a line that a soloist plays that I'm really interested in learning from, uh, I tend to put that track on repeat. Used to be a CD, not so often now, usually YouTube. And then sometimes I slow it down if it's a complicated line, and I learn that line. So here is a line that I found the other day by a beautiful jazz pianist, Peter Martin. So this is sort of immersing in the tradition. So I learned this line. This is it. Cool line, eh? It kind of sounds like a drummer. So we'll learn that line. And then the next thing we do is, as jazz musicians is uh, we study the line and work out what's going on harmonically. Uh, there it's, it's for, the, for what it's worth, minor pentatonic, and there's some blues motifs. Uninteresting, I know. But that's what's going on. So. 
And then the next thing we do is, as we immerse in the tradition, in order to learn it and get it under our fingers, to get it under our fingers, we practice it in all 12 keys. So, just to challenge myself, I'm going to try playing it in G flat, which is a nasty key. Bit ugly. That was better. And, and so you start to get it under your fingers, right? And then once you do that, you start to, you, with jazz, you don't just learn something, you've got to improvise with it. And that's when it gets into your heart, into your head, into your mind, and becomes a part of you. So you improvise with this line that you've learned, right? You let that inspire you and get under your skin. So Natalie and I are going to play 32 bars, and we're just going to improvise with this lick and try and learn from it and I'll try and grow as a pianist as we do. So here we go. This is Natalie Tweed, ladies and gentlemen, fresh from McGill Jazz Course, McGill University. She's awesome. in the biblical tradition takes the same kind of intelligent, slow soul work. And that's why we're here at Regent College. So we, we become familiar with the Bible. We become familiar with its characters, with its theology, with its literary forms. Maybe we learn the original languages. And just as with jazz, our relationship with the Bible is multifaceted. You, we're in love with Scripture. Sometimes we, we rage against Scripture. Sometimes we suspend judgment. Uh, sometimes we fall in love with Jesus again as we read Scripture. And as we persevere with Scripture and become familiar with it, it gets in our bones. Prick us and we bleed Scripture. Prick us and we bleed jazz. Depending on what tradition we're learning, we immerse in the tradition. But the... Uh, you know, the thing is, playing jazz, within a few seconds, if Natalie and I are playing, or if we're playing with any other jazz musician, within a few seconds, we know whether or not this musician, we recognize that this musician has spent those thousands of hours in the tradition. You, Natalie and I can hear it. We hear, oh, that other person knows the tradition. Phew, thank goodness. The gig isn't going to suck. <laughs> and it's the same with Scripture, you know. So we immerse ourselves in the tradition. But the nature of the biblical tradition is that it, just like jazz, it demands improvisation. It demands that creativity in a particular neighborhood, in a particular moment, just like the biblical authors did. It's the nature of the tradition. But it's not just any old creativity. The beauty and the depth and the richness of our creativity and our improvisation comes from being immersed in the tradition. It comes from Scripture. You, you, you can't create something beautiful in the life, word, and deed of the church unless we're immersed in Scripture. That's where the power comes from. That's where the depth comes from. So, you know, the challenge, I think, is just to imagine with your church community what beautiful melodies is the Spirit calling us to play in our neighborhood. You know, what beautiful rhythms is, is the scriptures forming us to tap in our neighborhood? How can we re-choreograph the sounds and the harmony of scripture in this particular place at this particular time? And I believe it's only with this kind of poetic imagination, also drawing on church history to be sure, but it's only with that kind of poetic imagination that we can improvise our part in this story as those who are sent for witness. John 20, 21. 
Jesus said, as the Father sent you, me, I am sending you. And improvisation, whether it's jazz or the church, is a communal activity. So let's illustrate that. But the point is, you know, in our churches, maybe there's someone in the church that starts to play a particular motif, starts to embody something beautiful in Scripture, and then maybe that shapes the whole performance in our particular neighborhood, you know. And in community with one another, we can, we can together ensure that we're always playing out of the tradition, inspiring one another to go deeper into the tradition. So we're going to play now, now with Sam Pang, we're going to play a beautiful tune that you know before the throne of God. And what we're going to do this time is we're going to really focus on listening to one another. We're going to focus on interdependence between one another. I think that church at its best is a conversation characterized by many conversations. And we're going to have a conversation together to illustrate that improvising church with the Bible in our hands is done with careful listening to one another. Here's before the throne of God. Thank you. 
So improvising church is a communal activity. And I am convinced, just to kind of uh, sum up what I've said so far, I am convinced that the key to, under, uh, to unlocking fresh imagination for the church is not a new strategy, but a rich understanding of the biblical story alongside embracing the invitation to improvise on the tradition. I believe that there's enough imagination, creativity, and tenderness in Scripture to last a lifetime. And to illustrate the creative imagination in Scripture, I want to focus on one particular motif now and zero in on one motif. Now, there's hundreds of motifs in Scripture we could zero in on for thinking about improvising church. And I do that in my forthcoming book called Improvising Church. Shameless plug. <laughs> Coming out in February. <coughs> um, but what I want to do now is to zero in on one motif, and it may surprise you, the maternal nurture, the maternal nurture of God. I want to zero in on that theme, the maternal nurture of God, for 20 minutes and unpack that as a motif for improvising church. Now, that may sound unusual to speak about the life and mission of the church and the maternal nurture of God, or even unlikely. And perhaps for some of us, the idea of offering maternal nurture may not feel familiar to us. But when you think about it, just as any of us could be paternalistic, any of us could be paternalistic, perhaps there's a sense in which any of us can think of ourselves as maternal, in a sense. So I'm thinking metaphorically, of course, when I think about the maternal nurture of the church. But the maternal nurture of God is, interestingly, a very prominent motive in Scripture. It's prominent in both Old and New Testaments. And I'm going to go to the Old Testament, specifically to the book of Ruth right now, to unpack this motif of the maternal nurture of God. The book of Ruth. Well, you know the story. So Ruth is from Moab. She's not an Israelite. She's a Moabitess, and she's been widowed. You know that. And you know that, that her mother-in-law, Naomi, is Israelite, and she is also widowed. And Ruth attaches herself to Naomi in a beautiful act of grace. And these two widowed women extremely vulnerable, go back to Israel, to Naomi's, the land that Naomi belongs to, in order to try and survive. Uh, you know that Ruth is the younger one of the two, and it's the time of the harvest, and Ruth goes into a field to glean behind the harvesters. Uh, maybe it's wheat, maybe it's barley, can't remember. But she's picking up the remaining of the grains behind the harvesters. And you know, too, of course, that she's gleaning by God's providence uh, in the field belonging to one of Naomi's kinspersons, Boaz, who owns the field. Now, the maternal nurture of God comes up in Ruth 2.12. Boaz blesses Ruth with these words, May you have a full reward from Yahweh, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. May you have full reward from Yahweh, the God of Israel, under whose wings you've come for refuge. The metaphor is Yahweh's wings, like a mother bird protecting her young. So Yahweh is pictured uh, metaphorically as this mother bird protecting its young. Now, I wonder, when I speak about maternal nurture, what does it mean? I should just say that for a second. To me, and I'll just say that humbly, to me, maternal nurture has this sense of tenderness and kinship. And to me, maternal nurture also has that sense of fierce protection, of strong, powerful protection for those it loves. And that makes sense, I think, in the book of Ruth. May you have a full reward, Boaz says to Ruth, from Yahweh, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to find refuge. Now, just let me take a light aside here. I, I can't help playing a pop song I grew up with right now. I'm going to play this pop song. It's a quick competition. 
for the person who calls out the artist. We're going back to the 80s. You will be showing your age if you get it right. You will be showing your age. My money's on Lisa Sung to nail this. I don't know if she was here. Richard Thompson would probably hit her. Okay, here we go. See if she can. We'll get Nat to play it too. So you call out the artist. Ready? One, two, two. Come on, Steve. Hey, come on. <laughs> Bed Midler, wings beneath my wings. It doesn't have much to, it doesn't advance my thesis at all. <laughs> but it's a really awesome tune. And it takes me back to the 80s. There's a justification. Now, this, this motif of the protective wings of Yahweh, Yahweh as a mother bird, is it's a motif that's, co that's common in the Old Testament. Maybe it occurs about ten times, especially in the Psalms. But do you see the way the scribe who both wrote the book of Ruth, this scribe who both the, wrote the book of Ruth, improvises on the tradition? Because always, almost always in the Old Testament, Yahweh's protective wings is for the sake of Israel, God's people. Yahweh's protective wings in the Old Testament is consistently for the sake of Israel, protecting Israel, God's chosen people. And here in the book of Ruth, the scribe improvises on the tradition and uses this metaphor to communicate uh, Yahweh's protective nurture of this vulnerable immigrant, this, assignment, this asylum seeker, if you like, Ruth, this refugee person. He, the scribe improvises on the tradition you could say it takes a risk, maybe. It's not such a long bow. Of course, the Torah is, is full of testimony to God's even covenant with the stranger, with the refugee. Deuteronomy 10, 18 and 19, for example. But here is a scribe improvising on the tradition and, almost, and communicating with Boaz's blessing that this is almost like a, um, a recognizable characteristic of Yahweh, that Yahweh is that kind of God that would unfold a, a vulnerable newcomer, a vulnerable immigrant. In other words, Boaz is almost saying, if you want to find a place to belong, Ruth, you've come to the right place, to come to the land of Yahweh. Improvising on the tradition. I have a friend who was a farmer in Ontario, a Christian Reformed Church pastor as an adult, but grew up on a farm. Gracie Rorder shares his friend. His name's Andrew. Andrew grew up on a farm, and he told me the story once of a barn fire that took place on their farm. And he said once they managed to finally put the blaze out, he and the family entered the barn to see the damage. He said every animal in the, in the barn had died, these charred bodies of animals. And there was a mother hen there lying on the ground, and my friend Andrew shifted the carcass the charred body of this mother hen. And you know, when he shifted the body of this mother hen, he said there were 10 or 12 yellow chicks fully alive, scurrying out. Isn't that beautiful? This mother hen somehow, faced with the heat of this blaze, spread out her wings and had such courage and strength, such courage and strength, to protect her young. Boaz says to Ruth, may you have full reward from Yahweh, the God of Israel, under whose wings you've come for refuge. The powerful wings of a mother bird. And Yahweh, the maternal nurture of Yahweh, the tenderness and the fierce protection of Yahweh. You know, you may never know the ways in which God has protected you already today. You know, protected you from the evil one, 
protected you from harm. Maybe through a friend. Maybe through angels. You know, you may never know how the victory of the cross, that victory over sin and death and the evil one that Christ won on the cross, has protected you today. But it has. It has. And here in the book of Ruth, it extends even to protect a refugee, a vulnerable newcomer. The maternal nurture of Yahweh. The Bible speaks of it again and again. I'd love to illustrate this motif musically with Sam and Natalie now. And in both jazz and classical music, there's a way of writing a melody that to me uh, speaks of this maternal nurture of God. And it's a way of a melody in folds, notes. Sometimes we speak of goal notes. We're going to play a Bach tune that you'll know well. Let me play it for you. I made two mistakes. Sam Pang is like dying a thousand days. <laughs> some melody, isn't it? And the power in that melody is the enfolding. Uh, it enfolds gold, gold notes. I'll show you. That's the first gold note. It goes. So it encloses. It plays the note above it and below it. And then it does it again for the next gold note. See that enfolding? In jazz music, we call it enclosing, an enclosure. That's where, the, that's where the intensity comes from. But it's like a nurture. It's almost like Bach is giving those notes a hug. Right? And then the incredible thing is the whole thing enfolds everything that's come before. And then back into the hearth in the middle. In front of the fireplace where the family gathers. Incredible melody, isn't it? So we're going to play Yesu, Joy of Man's Desire, which you've heard at almost every wedding you've ever attended. <laughs> and Sam Pang is going to be really disgusted at the way these jazz musicians <laughs> st stuff up <laughs> his wonderful classical <laughs> tradition. <laughs> but I just invite you just to reflect with joy on the maternal nurture of Yahweh as you hear these enclosures, these hugs in this bark piece.
As the story of Ruth progresses, this pattern of enfolding enriches and gets thicker. You remember that the important scene of the threshing floor. So Boaz has blessed Ruth and said, May you, under whose wings you have come to find refuge, speaking of Yahweh. And now on the threshing floor, Ruth lies down at Boaz's feet and says, Spread your cloak over me. But the word for cloak is the same as the Hebrew word for Yahweh's wings. So the word for cloak, the Hebrew's word for cloak, is the same as the Hebrew word for Yahweh's wings. And Ruth is really saying to Boaz, you be the answer to your own prayer. You be the answer to your own prayer. May Yahweh spread Yahweh's wings over me through you. Spread your cloak over me, Ruth says. And I see that kind of reflected in this beautiful tune, Yesu, Joy of Man's Desiring, that has this double enfolding. There's these goal notes that are surrounded, and then Bach surrounds the whole thing. It's so beautiful. And that to me is this, this, this ry rhythm or this movement of Christian discipleship, a double, a double enfolding that were enfolded by God in God's maternal nurture. And then we extend that maternal nurture to one another, to our neighborhood, to others. And that's where I want to land the church's maternal nurture in the name of Jesus. Maternal nurture as a motif for improvising church. You know, the Pope, Pope Francis, gave a TED talk. Did you know that? <laughs> he did. It was amazing. A and he spoke about, he said that we need a revolution of tenderness. You know, I think that tenderness is at the heart of maternal nurture, I think. And the Pope said we need a revolution of tenderness. How good is that? You know, the maternal nurture of the church in the name of Jesus is a revolution of tenderness. Tenderness entails softening our hearts, or softening the boundaries of our lives to make room for others in all their mark and mass. It also entails emotional sensitivity and empathy, uh, grieving what Christ grieves and celebrating what Christ celebrates. Tenderness demands that we extend trust and choose hope. Tenderness of God. I've noticed as I read the Gospels, the way that when people encounter Christ, they encounter Christ's tenderness. The rich young ruler, for example, Mark 10, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Or the demoniac, he begged Jesus to allow him to go with him. The maternal nurture of the church in Jesus' name. That's interesting. Maternal nurture also entails fierce protection. Fierce protection. My mother, who died five years ago, she was a fierce protector. She was by trade a psychologist, a, a deeply experienced counsellor. And my mother was a powerful advocate for survivors of sexual abuse. And uncooperative clergy or intransigent school principals, they didn't know what had happened to them when June Glanville strode into their office. <laughs> Maternal nurture as fierce protection and advocacy. And, you know, I think on this note, you know, we should ensure that together in the church, women and men are nourishing church cultures marked by healthy, safe and life-giving relationships. 
A local example of maternal nurture as fierce protection here in Vancouver is the organization REED, R-E-E-D, Resist Exploitation, Embrace Dignity. Now, REED was birthed in 2005 by a Regent grad, Michelle Miller, a friend of mine. Michelle's about my age and birthed out of our former church. REED, uh, birthed in 2005 and still going today, advocates for women who are trapped in the sex industry in Vancouver. And back in 2005, there were no anti-trafficking laws, no human trafficking laws in Canada at all. So there was no legal protection for women entrapped in the sex industry. So Michelle began Reed with a commitment to provide individual care for individual women who were caught in this industry. But then pretty soon they realized that these women aren't just kind of caught individually in their own story, but they're entrapped within systems. They realize that the vast industries of internet porn and webcam prostitution rely upon exploitation and trafficking. And so Reed's work expanded to interfering with the system, including the work of political advocacy and education. Well, that's the example of Reed. I wonder about this motif for you in your particular community, in your particular church, in your place. I wonder what imagination for improvising church, the motif of maternal nurture brings to your mind. Sam, Natalie and I will just play, why don't we just play just the eight, first eight bars of Yesu. I just invite you just to reflect on this biblical motif of the maternal nurture of God and just be curious, is there an invitation for you and for your community? So friends, today, in this last half hour, I began by exploring this idea of improvising church using the metaphor of jazz. Just to recap, I, sp I noted that both jazz and Christianity is deeply rooted in a tradition, but that in both cases the tradition itself doesn't just invite, it almost demands that we improvise on the tradition in a particular moment, in a particular place, both on the bandstand and in our neighbourhoods, taking our lead from the, the, uh, the direction of the biblical authors themselves. And then in the second half of our time together, I offered just one motif, the motif of maternal nurture. Offering this motif as just one biblical motif for improvising church of, of hundreds, just one note for improvising on the tradition. I mean, of course, in jazz, you can improvise just with one note. For example, like this. But two notes is more fun. Or four, three. Four. Or twelve. Let me just offer one, I've, I've unpacked one note for improvising on the tradition, maternal nurture. Let me just spend 20 seconds to offer a second note. I think that beauty, creativity and aesthetics is really important as we improvise church at this time in the West. And I hope that this jazz homily today demonstrates the importance of beauty creativity and aesthetics as an important note for improvising church. I think beauty in the arts is exactly what the church needs, among other things, as we hold out the word of life at this time. I offer that churches need to excel in creating art and living artistically. 
This is so that our faith in Jesus can shine out in a way that's evocative beyond words. My friend Steve Gomez said to me a month or two ago, beauty is an experience of God, a taste of God. Does that sound like Stephen Gomez? Yeah. Thank you so much for listening. We want to go out with one more tune. And uh, we want to play that beautiful melody, Jesus Loves Me, this I know, that so many of us grew up with as kids. And we will play it and improvise on it. And then after a while, I'll invite you to stand and you can sing along. Here's Jesus Loves Me. to stand I think you know the words